The American Meat Institute presents The Life of Riley, a half hour with radio's newest and friendliest family, and starring William Bendix as Riley. Have you ever wondered why all of us like meat so well? Well, meat brings you aroma, flavor, and you get up from the table feeling you've eaten well. But there is another reason which not all of us realize so fully. The body must have proteins for growth and tissue repair. The right kind of protein. Meat has that right kind of protein. That's why meat is the yardstick of protein foods. Meat measures up to every protein need. And now, the life of Riley. The life of Riley. A life in which a calm usually precedes a storm. Uh, bear that in mind as we drop in on the Rileys now, sitting serenely about their kitchen table, enjoying the great Sunday morning institution of late breakfast with a Sunday paper on the side. Junior, may I have the funnies now? No, I ain't through, Bab. Junior, answer your sister politely. No, thank you, I ain't through. Well, I guess it's all up with Superman now. Why? He just changed from Clark Kent to Superman and forgot to take off his glasses. Oh, well, this is awful. Well, what's the matter, Uncle Baxter? Bad news on the financial page? Yes, the Treasury Department reports that there is a serious shortage of $10,000 bills. <laughs> you don't say. To tell the truth, I ain't noticed it lately, but since I know you, Uncle Baxter, I've been having a shortage of $1 bills. <laughs> Now, Riley, Uncle Baxter will pay us anything he borrows when he finds work. Won't you, Uncle Baxter? Indeed I will, my dear niece. Everyone knows I've tried to secure employment. After all, there's a depression. The only depression today is in your mattress. <laughs> Boy, that Superman's terrific. He took off his glasses just in time, and with his X-ray eyes, he can find anything. Ah, uh, if I was writing Superman, I'd know how to stump him. First, I'd have Superman marry Superwoman. Then I'd have them have three super babies. Then I'd bring the super family to Los Angeles and then let them try and find a vacant apartment. What an imagination, Daddy. You ought to write stories. Yeah. Yeah, I got an idea for a story right now. It's a fairy story, kind of. What's the plot? Well, once upon a time, there was a family consistent of people. There was a man who worked in a war plant and his wife, and they had two kids. Just like us? Yeah, exactly like us. So this family had a nice little house, see? Only they got one room in this house they doesn't go into. Oh, like Bluebeard? Gosh, is it a haunted room, Pop? Uh, uh, why, Uncle Baxter. What? Uh, you, you, I begin to suspect that this mad yarn is directed at me. <laughs> Uncle Baxter, am I calling you a wolf? A wolf only comes as far as outside the door. But if the show's pinch, take them off. They're my new ones. Oh, <laughs> Riley. Riley, innuendo is a cruel and callous blade with which to stab a foe. I shall go now to my room and prepare to leave. Oh, now, Uncle Beck. I shall pack immediately after lunch and leave immediately after dinner. <laughs> Tomorrow. <laughs> Riley, may I borrow your suitcase? With pleasure. Well, Riley, I hope you're satisfied. Not quite. Junior, go help him pack. Okay, Pop. <laughs> I'm going to my room, Mother. Um, if Uncle Baxter did leave, could I have his room? It's bigger than mine. Babs, you've got a nice room now. Anyway, my head's all made up what to do with Baxter's room. If I ever get it empty. Riley, I'm ashamed of you. Have you forgotten that two years ago, Uncle Baxter gave you a blood transfusion that saved your life? I ain't forgotten. All I know is that since I'm using Baxter's blood, I don't have to swat mosquitoes anymore. <laughs> they just bite me and drop dead. Now, you know you wouldn't let Uncle Baxter leave here uh, with no job and no home to go to. Oh, Peg, this is for his own sake. If I make him hit the road, he'll have to get a job. There's plenty of jobs open for guys who want to work. Besides, I could sure use his room. 
What do you want an extra room for? Well, Peg, down at the plant, the fellas are always gabbing about their houses they live in. And they all got one thing I ain't got. You mean a rumpus room? Well, no. In our house, every room's a rumpus room. <laughs> I want a room where I can take fellas and show them all my stuff. You know, all, all my guns and fish rods and moose heads and oh, all that. what guns and what fish heads? Well, the ones I'd get to put in my den if I had a den. Oh, <laughs> you want a den? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I've been thinking about it a long time now. I'd have the walls all wood, you know, nutty pine. Mm. <laughs> Why, yes, and I could keep my sewing machine in there, too. Oh, no, nothing doing. I ain't going to have some guy I invite say, Riley, stitch me up a doily. <laughs> no, no. No, in my den, there's going to be just things I catch hunting, you know, like a stuffed animal. Oh, you never caught any animal in your life. Oh, is that so? Well... Well, until I do catch one, I'll write to Joe McArdle in Brooklyn. Maybe he'll sell me that stuffed goat that advertises Bach beer in his saloon. Oh, an old goat. Well, you must have some funny friends if they'd rather look at an old goat than at my sewing machine. Well, now, that ain't the point, and Peg. poor Uncle Baxter. Thrown out of the house to make room for an old goat. I won't stand for it. If Baxter wants to stay in my den, he's got to be stuffed. <laughs> Peg, the way you talk now is my why men want then. Besides, Baxter's 55 years old. Kid ought to get started in life. <laughs> you know, raise a family, get married. With a wife that would drive him into his den, too, I suppose. No, Dumplin, a nice wife like you. Only who would marry Uncle Baxter? I don't know. He used to be quite a ladies' man in his day. Well, I was reading in the society page today about an old flame of Uncle Baxter's named... Riley. Me? I ain't no old flame of Uncle Baxter. <laughs> no, no, no. I just thought of something. Oh. This old sweetheart of Baxter's is a very wealthy woman. Her family were big people in cement. They must have been a gruesome sight. <laughs> she adored Uncle Baxter, but her people made her marry a man named Farrell. Uh, she's a widow now. Widow, huh? Well, sometimes a widow ain't so fussy. The paper says she's coming back here to reopen the old family mansion. Mm. Baxter would have a mansion. And we'd have his bedroom back for my den. Uh, you think she'd be a fairly good-looking woman, Peg? Well, here's a picture in the paper, see? Hmm. Hmm, framed that face and a lot of money and it ain't bad. <laughs> okay, I give my consent. Now all we've got to do is to get Baxter's consent. <laughs> You know, Uncle Baxter, the minute I saw her name in the paper, I said, why, that's the woman who was so crazy about Uncle Baxter. My, it's dear little Julia. She had all the qualifications that a bride should have. She had money. <laughs> she, uh, still has a... Still has a very nice smile, hasn't she? And she still has money. Uncle Baxter, I have a lovely idea. Why not give Julia a surprise? Why not call her up? Oh, no, no, no. Why rake over the ashes of an old love? Oh, uh, speaking of ashes, here's an ad in the paper where a fellow will sell an ashtray made of an alligator's lower jaw that would look good in a man's den. Uncle Baxter, I'll bet Julia would love to hear from you. You think so, really? I, I've aged a bit since my Harvard days, you know. Oh, why, that touch of gray at your temples makes you look like a movie actor, doesn't it, Riley? <laughs> yeah, if I was a wave... If I was a wave, you would be my pinup boy. Say, uh, here's an ad where a man will sell a headhunter's head. Just what I need for my den. <laughs> Dear, when I think of that poor Julia alone in a beautiful mansion with no one to talk to. Yes, I suppose her house has a nice bar. Here's a man got a couple of pillars to sell stuffed with pine needles. Just the aroma I'm looking for. It'll go good with the goat. <laughs> Riley, will you put down that huh? paper and talk to Uncle Baxter? Oh, well, okay. Uh, now, Baxter, about this goat, that, 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 this widow. Why don't you call her up like Peg says? Oh, but it might lead to renewed romance, even matrimony. Oh, no, I'll end my days with you. I couldn't leave you two children to face life alone. Don't worry, Uncle Baxter. We'll muddle through. <laughs> Uncle Baxter, I think you'd be very happy with a nice wife like Mrs. Farrell. Oh, go on, Uncle Baxter. Call her up. Give her a thrill. 
You know, I think I shall. Yes. I'll make an appointment to call on Julia at her palatial home. What a boy. But I warn you, Riley, Julia may steal me away from you. Well, sure she will, Uncle Baxter. And I want you to be the first to congratulate me. My Uncle Baxter, you're a fast worker. The first time you call your girlfriend in years and she invites you over the same night. Well, Babs, uh, our long sign, you know. Hey, Uncle Baxter, was it you who took a bath with Mom's geranium soap I gave her Christmas? I told him he could, Junior. Gee, Uncle Baxter, you smell good. You should be standing in a flower pot. <laughs> Here, I'll, I'll let you wear my diamond ring I won at the carnival. Oh, fine. It catches the light well, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, don't forget, and I'll give her a flash of that every so often. Scratch your head even if you don't need to. <laughs> well, I'm off. Uh... Riley, I, I'm afraid I'm a bit short of cash. Oh, well, that's okay, Baxter. Here, I... Think... Oh, no, I'm, I'm out to it. Oh, dear, I gave all my cash to the milkman today. My allowance for this week is all gone. My allowance for this week was gone last week. <laughs> well, I certainly can't call on Julia devoid of fun. Uncle Baxter, I ain't gonna let you down. Junior, lend him what's in your piggy bank. Oh, I worked too hard for that dough to throw it to the four winds. Junior, that's hardly sporting. Go on, Junior. Lend him the dough, and I'll personally guarantee it. Okay. There's eight sixty-five in nickels. Put some in all your pockets, Uncle Baxter, and keep jingling them. Then, then she'll know you're loaded with dough. <laughs> Thank you. Well, I go to make a lonely woman happy. He don't know it, but if he lands the widow, he'll make a lot of people happy. <laughs> Hello? Yeah. Yeah, this is Rally. Oh, yeah, yeah, I called about your ad in the paper. Well, listen, uh, well, uh, how secondhand is it? Yeah. Oh, painted green with silver trimmings, huh? Oh, you hold that for me. I'll let you know. Goodbye. Peg, I found one. Something I wanted all my life. Something every man uses but nobody owns. A private one. Boy, if I can get that for my den, then I'll have the best den in town. And now, while we're waiting to see if Baxter lands the widow and Riley gets his den, this is Ken Niles with a question. Have you ever driven over a bridge and marveled at the tremendous loads it could carry? Yes, any bridge must have amazing strength built into it to sustain its burden day after day, year after year. Your meat industry is a bridge over which flows the meat of this country, from farms to homes and to war. Let's see what kind of a load it is called upon to carry. Thirty-five billion pounds since Pearl Harbor. Well, how much is that? You know what a sensational job of meeting wartime needs the shipbuilders have done. Ships are usually measured in tons, but to make a comparison, let's talk about them in pounds. In the two years after Pearl Harbor, this country produced 54 billion pounds of cargo ships. It will probably surprise you to know that during the same period, the meatpacking industry produced almost two-thirds as much meat, 35 billion pounds in all. To get that meat from where it was produced to where it was needed, to put it on the home tables of our workers and our allies and into the mess kits of our fighters, has been the responsibility of your meatpacking industry. With fewer workers, with more meat to handle, it has met this great emergency with the capacity and efficiency built up over the years. Yes, the bridge which your meat industry has built in peacetime has proved itself strong enough to serve the nation well under the urgent demands of war. And now back to the life of Riley. We left the Rileys just as Uncle Baxter was setting out to renew his acquaintance with an old and very well-to-do sweetheart. Riley was anticipating the purchase of a mysterious article for his den. A few days have passed, and we find Riley and Peg in Baxter's bedroom still discussing the same two topics. Well, three days Baxter's been wooing the widow, and she ain't said yes yet. 
But he's really trying, dear. Yeah. Yeah, they must have seen every show in town and et in every high-class joint. Set me back plenty. But it'll be worth it if the nuptials come off. Peg, I'm getting one thing for my den that'll knock your eye out. Hmm? Must be a pool cue. No, no. Terrific. And I'm going to put it right here in the middle of the room. Then I got an oriental brass cuspidor that goes over this spot in the rug where Baxter spilled the hair tonic. So you know I think the nap is growing. <laughs> no, yes, dear. <laughs> Riley, hey. Hey, Baxter, what's the score? You, did you ask you yet? Where are you going for your honeymoon? My dear children, I have news for you. Wait a minute, Baxter. What's the idea of wearing my new blue suit? What? Oh, that can't be your suit, dear. It fits Uncle Baxter too well. Well, to be frank, it is Riley's suit. I had it altered for me. <laughs> you had my suit altered to not fit me? <laughs> to be serene, Riley, count your blessings. Julia liked me in this suit. Hey, what's that in your hand? My picture off the mantle. And yours is up in its place. I can explain, my dear nephew. And what's that in your other hand? My name off in the mailbox. Say, what are you trying to do? Make me unconspicuous? I can explain, Riley. You put my picture back. As long as I cough up the rent and other people live here free, they got to look at my mug. That's the price they pay. <laughs> Riley, you see, Julia, my fiancée-to-be, is coming here tonight. And I was forced to put my name and picture in place of yours. Why? Well, you see, somehow, Junior got the impression that I was a banker and that I owned this house. I don't know how. <laughs> you don't know how. It uh, couldn't be you gave her a little hint, could it? Like, like Julia, I'm a banker and I own the house. <laughs> Why, I have to keep up an appearance of well-being, Riley. But if she thinks that this is your house... What will she think we're doing here? I can explain that also. This better be good. Uh, somehow, Julia also gained the impression that you were my, uh, poor relation? <laughs> oh, Uncle Baxter. Why, so we're poor relations, huh? Well, the minute that Mrs. Farrell walks in here, I'll tell her. No, no, I won't tell her anything. Thank you, Riley. I'll just show her my income tax where it says you're listed in three places. <laughs> Chief dependent, bad debts, and depreciation. <laughs> you living here has lowered property value. Riley, uh, we can go through with this idea just for one well, night. Of course, Riley, if you don't want me to marry Julia and leave your home. Wait a minute. Hello? Yeah. What? You can't hold it for me after tonight. Well, uh, well, well, okay, deliver it. Goodbye. I gotta have it for my den. Okay, Baxter, just for tonight. Oh, While Mrs. Farrell is around, you're the boss. But I'll be watching to see you do your stuff. So think up how to pop the $64 question and get yes for an answer. <laughs> Baxter and Mrs. Farrell through that crack in the door, Pop? Yeah. Yeah, he's just going to kiss her hand. Now he's stopped. He's appraising her ring. <laughs> Look out, here comes Mom with some dishes. Oh, Julia likes the dinner, Riley. My, she's got lovely clothes, hasn't she? Yeah. Yeah, Baxter looks good in my suit, too. Any signs of his getting to first base with the widow yet, or do I have to go into the coaching box? Give him time, dear. Now, take in this coffee and don't say anything. Uh, I know when to keep my mouth shut. <laughs> oh, well, oh, folks, I uh, hope I ain't putting into nothing private you wanted to say to each other. Here, Mrs. Farrell, toss some of this coffee down your hatch. <laughs> oh, thank you. Thank you, Riley. You may have your coffee now in the kitchen. Thank you. Here, dear, kind, generous Uncle Baxter. Goggle some of this jargon. It's great to clear up your voice. His voice? Why, Baxter, it seems clear enough to me. But I just meant if he had, like, like some question to ask somebody, I wouldn't want them to miss it. Riley, 
if you must use this room, Julia and I could have coffee in the library. The library. <laughs> Mrs. Farrell, he's a card. We got two esquires on top of the piano. He calls it a library. <laughs> Riley, if you're not very careful, I'm afraid I'll have to cancel your plans for that den you wanted. You understand? Why, Baxter, are you building a den for your nephew? How nice of you. Oh, it's nothing. Mrs. I... Farrell, he's always doing things for me. Tomorrow he's giving me that suit he's wearing. Of course, I may have to get altered to fit it. Boy, I'm going to have a nifty den. Look, I already got this, this fishing rod here for it. Riley, perhaps Peg wants you in the kitchen. Oh, the last time I fished was on our yacht. The day I lost Alonzo. What's Alonzo? One of them big barracudas? <laughs> Alonzo was my late husband. Oh, sorry. Um, uh, fishing. Fishing reminds me of dear old Birdie Holloway. Great game fisherman, Birdie, huh? Yes, he was an expert dry fly caster. I'm strictly a wet clam man myself. <laughs> Whatever became of good old Bertie, Julia? Did he marry the Van der Vander girl? Oh, no, Baxter. He waited too long. <laughs> Poor Bertie. Mm. Probably too slow on his feet. Sat around guzzling coffee instead of popping the question, maybe. Uh, oh, Baxter? But why does Riley keep winking, Baxter? Some nervous trouble? Uh, 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 yeah, I'm nervous today. I'm, I'm as nervous as a bridegroom. Riley... Someone wants you in the kitchen. Who does? I do. <laughs> oh, oh, yeah, I get it. I, <laughs> two's company, three's a crowd. Well, see you in church. <laughs> Wiley. <laughs> oh, thank goodness he's gone. Baxter. Now, I think it's fine of you to look after these people, but... Well, they... one does one's duty, doesn't one? Yes, but you mustn't humor them too far. It spoils them. A den for Riley, trout rods. Why doesn't that shiftless man get a job? Oh, it's no use, Julia. Many's the time Riley and I have had heated words on the subject of going to work. <laughs> Baxter, now, I'm saying this because I have your interests at heart. Why, suppose you were to have the handling of... Well, of a very large estate. Such as yours, Julia, such as yours. Oh, yes, I could handle it. I, I never allow the Rileys to buy anything really unnecessary. I... There are certain laws of economy that I feel must apply. Well, and... I... <gasps> My goodness. What's that? In the hall. I I'll see. Riley, what is that? All right. Take it easy, Junior. Now, not too fast. We'll break it. Good. Okay. <sighs> Well, here she is, the surprise for my den. Baxter, you bought him that huge whatever it is? This is a complete surprise to me, believe me, Julia. Riley, for goodness sake, what is that thing all wrapped up in sheep? Oh, well, you see it. Nobody's got one of these in his den but me. When I get it, then. Well, let's see it, Pop. Come on. All right. Oh, I wish I had an unfailing speech, but... Well, anyway, here goes... Here she is, a genuine old-time barber chair. <laughs> Shave and a haircut, shampoo. <laughs> oh, why, it's Baxter, this is fantastic. Riley, what do you want with an old barber chair? Well, Peg, do you know who once sat in this chair? John L. Sullivan. Right before he lost the title. He got shaved in this chair, and then Corbett clipped him. <laughs> Oh, gee, Pop, it's keen. Yeah. Look at all the different angles you can get. Yeah, go go on, sit in it, Mrs. Farrell. Oh, no, 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 thanks. Hey, Pop, let me push him up. No, 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 leave it low, Junior. Boy, it's slick. I can lay back in it and read while I shave myself with my electric razor. Julia, perhaps I'd better take you home. No, no, wait a minute. I want Mrs. Farrell to have the honor to be the first one to sit in my barber chair. Oh, no, no, thank you, but really... Oh, I... come on, be a sport. Here, I'll help you. Well, if you insist... Uh, Riley, I implore you. Oh, oh, Daisy! Well, ah. My, I, I've had some odd experiences, but... Julia, I entreat you. Relax, Mrs. Farrell. Now lean back. Go on, lean back. Oh. Ah. There, now. Ain't that comfortable? Well, yes, it is rather comfortable. See what you're missing by not being a man? Now, uh, how about a shave? <laughs> now, if, if you need a haircut, you go up again like this. No! Oh, 
<laughs> and I suppose you got a tall barber. Then you'd have to go up in the air more like this. Oh, be careful. Not too high. <laughs> Julia, are you injured? No, I don't think so, Mr. Turnbull. Well, Julia, now you can tell your children, all the little Turnbulls, that you sat in the same chair with John L. Sullivan. My children? The little Turnbull? Uh, uh, forgive him, Julia. He does know what he's saying. For goodness sake, Riley, let Uncle Baxter do his own proposing. Well, Baxter, it seems something is expected of you. Well, Julia, the, the fact is, after all these years, I thought that perhaps you and I might get hit. Uh, <laughs> oh, I see. Well, Baxter, I, I don't doubt the depths of your affection for me, but I can never marry you. You have other responsibilities. These poor, unfortunate Rileys depend on you to take care of them. Well, couldn't you both take care of us? No. Baxter, you must be here with them all the time. They need you more than I do. Then, then you wouldn't like us to file a joint income tax return next year? I'm sorry, Baxter. Now, if you'll see me to my car... Yes, of course, my dear. That's the way it goes. They bite the hand that feeds them. Can you beat that? She turned him down so he could take care of us. Now we're stuck with him. And you're stuck with that barber chair. Yeah. Well, there's only one thing to do now. What? Uncle Baxter will have to go to barber college. <laughs> The Rileys will be back in just a moment. American Meat Institute shopping reminder for this week. Bacon, one point. Lard, no points per pound. And most types of sausage have been reduced one or two points per pound. And you'll want to take advantage of these values. And now, anyone who knows New Orleans knows that famous restaurant called La Louisiane and its distinguished chef, Monsieur Charles Pivert, better known as Chef Anatole. Now, you may be sure that meat rationing doesn't bother Chef Anatole when you see what he can do with the simple low-point cuts of meat like breast of veal, breast of lamb, or beef stew meat. He cooks his dish with onions, green peppers, tomatoes, and other vegetables, seasons it with a bouquet garni, which you housewives know is an herb bouquet of parsley, bay leaves, thyme, and cloves, and serves it with fluffy rice. And when you taste that combination of delicious meat tender vegetables, and delicate herbs. Ah, you know, here is a dish. You'll find the complete recipe in the American Meat Institute's advertisement in your April Good Housekeeping or Ladies Home Journal. Note that Chef Anatole recommends the same recipe for low-point cuts of beef, lamb, and veal. And remember, no matter what kind or cut, price or point, all meat brings you the right kind of protein. Yes, meat is the yardstick of protein foods because meat measures up to every protein need. All statements regarding the nutritional value of meat made on this program are accepted by the Council on Foods and Nutrition of the American Medical Association. Riley, it's almost midnight. It's time to go to bed. Oh, Peg, I'm so comfortable. I think I'll stay right here. You will not spend the night in that barber chair. <laughs> oh, all right. But I'm going to stay right here till I finish reading the sporting page. Ain't it funny? Once you get in the habit of reading laying down, the newspaper don't make sense when you read it sitting up. <laughs> The Life of Riley, starring William Bendix and sponsored by the American Meat Institute, will be back next week at this same time. William Bendix appears on this program by arrangement with Hal Roach. The Life of Riley was directed by Don Bernard, with music by Lou Kozloff, 
and came to you from Hollywood. This is Ken Nile saying, see you all next week.